guests, colleagues, students, good evening and welcome to the Newton Building for this Business Leaders Lecture. Thank you for coming. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome Mike Keoghan, Deputy National Statistician, that's a, that's a job title, to the university this evening to talk about artificial intelligence, data and the economy. Actually, I haven't given Mike his full title there because he is also Director General of the Economic, Social and Environmental Group at the Office for National Statistics. And this role, as we will see tonight, ensures that academics and policymakers and members of the public have access to data of the quality and sophistication needed to make predictions, plan policy and understand our world. Before this role, Mike was Chief Economic Advisor and Director of Analysis at the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. And between 2020 and 2021, he also held the role of Acting Director General for Business Sectors in that department. And during this time, he was responsible for leading the UK government's business policy, including delivering the EU business readiness programme before the UK's exit from the European Union. Trained as an economic historian, Mike is relentlessly forward-looking. <laughs> and in his role in the ONS, he drives innovation, he drives the transformation of economic statistics, and he's expanding the officer's work on the environment. Tonight, Mike will help us look into the future of the role of artificial intelligence in data and how this could affect one of the ONS's largest data exercises, the National Census. Because there is now a wealth of public data and we have sophisticated computer modeling capability and so the ONS is asking questions about the purpose of such a large-scale survey as the census in generating a picture of our society. Mike will discuss the ONS programme of research to expand the range of data sources it uses. He will consider the significant advances made in data science and computing capability. And he's going to share with us how the ONS is using new ways to offer deeper insights into our rapidly changing society. Because this encompasses a huge range of areas. It's everything from patterns in expenditure on research and development, right through to the evolution of the nighttime economy, I believe. So taking us through the scope and scale and sophistication of the work of statisticians, Mike will help us understand how the way in which we generate and make sense of data is changing forever. So, Without further delay, please join me in a warm welcome to Mike Keoghan. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, sounds all right, doesn't it? Um, thank, thank you very much for that generous introduction. I'd also like to thank all of you for making it here on, in the middle of Storm Kieran. Um, and also Professor Yazdani for the invitation and also Will Roster who actually basically is the creator of this particular uh, presentation. Um, it's worth saying, uh, this came from some work that we've been doing in the ONS to improve local decision making, local information provision for decision makers, a thing we called ONS Local. And I, I bumped into Will at one of those events, and I'd previously worked with him uh, when we were working on regional policy about a thousand years ago. And he thought it'd be a really good thing to come along and talk about the work of the office here today. So I'm really grateful for that. Um, for that opportunity. Um, and this whole point about local is also something I want to come back to throughout the, the presentation because it is something where we are really keen to, um, to do more and to be more active. So what I want to do today, as we said in the introduction, is just talk through a bit about the ONS. And that's actually quite shameless on my behalf because we are a major employer of talented graduates. So we would like to use this as the opportunity to kind of put out our stall and get you to think about a career in the ONS, or at the very least, government analysis. 
So, you know, I'm very happy in the Q&A to pick up any questions around that, but I will also, again, talk through as, as we go along. I want to talk about what we do as an office. I want to then talk a bit about data and modern forms of data. Uh, and then at the end, some thoughts about what, where we're going on AI and large language models, which I think is particularly interesting given the Prime Minister's hosting of the summit at Bletchley at the moment around the future of safe AI. So I hope that's what you're expecting. I intend to talk about 20 minutes, but we've got, I think, about 10, 15 minutes for Q&A. So hopefully you'll have some, I'm sure you will have some excellent questions for me. So just at the beginning of the ONS, the ONS is the UK's National Statistical Institute. Every country's got an, what's called an NSI. Right? And the point of these institutions is they produce the critical statistics that every country needs to run itself. And the ONS is the UK's one. There are um, supplementary organisations that we work closely with in Northern Ireland and Scotland. And the, the ONS does a lot of the kind of heavy lifting across the whole of the UK, but also in terms of England and Wales. We do economic, social, population stats. We publish 600 releases a year. We don't publish in the weekends, so we're basically pumping out roughly three outputs a day, right? Covering the whole range of um, what the, you know, what, what our country is doing. We're describing the UK. If you go onto the ONS release calendar, type that into Google, you'll get what we, what we published, what we're going to publish. Um, lots of stuff. And we also are constantly trying to improve what we do. Because statistics, you know, we are trying to describe the economy. We're trying to describe society. And society and the economy are always changing. So the problem, the challenge, the privilege of being of, in the ONS is that you're basically constantly trying to measure something that is always moving. And therefore, having, you know, continually researching what's happening out there, changing the way we do things, changing what we measure, allows us to keep pace with this incredibly dynamic society that we all live in. And that's what we... You know, that's really what we're kind of, in terms of the kind of the more longer term work of the office, that's what we're trying to get at. And that's where some of our really interesting work on kind of data science and AI takes us. So we're, who, where are, who are we, right? So we are basically across, across the UK, basically across England and Wales. Our head office is Newport in South Wales. That is the, where the bulk of, bulk of staff are. Titchfield is the home in, in Hampshire, in Southampton, near Southampton. That's the home of the census. Did anyone, did, I hope the answer to this is yes. Who filled in their census in 2021? God, it's got to be more than that to be sponsored. It was like 95%. <laughs> right, so when you fill that in, all the processing is done by a team in Titchfield, who then produce all that really, really valuable information about what the country is like. And that then cascades through decision-making, other statistics provide the baseline of how, how we understand the UK. Um, field. Field is, does not mean we've got people standing in fields. Field is our field force. Has anyone filled in an ONS survey? Other than the census? Anyone? Yeah. So you'll get a knock on the door and someone will say, will you please fill in the census, fill in, fill in the survey. That's our field force. It's actually really important, and because I'm, I'm, I've got you all here and you are all substantially younger than me, we have a real problem with younger people filling in surveys. And that's not just a problem for the statistics. And it is a problem for the statistics. But it's also because it means kind of your voices don't necessarily get heard in the data. We have, we've got lots of ways of fixing it, lots of clever techniques. But it would be tremendous. You know, one of the big problems across the developed world is... You know, when the NSI person knocks on the door and asks you, will you fill in the labour force survey or the crime survey or some of the social surveys or the opinion surveys, typically younger people don't fill them in. And I think that's a real shame and it's a, real, it's a problem on public policy. So I just encourage you, if you will take one thing from this talk, when the ONS come knocking, please, please say yes. We've got a small team in London that basically works at the Bank of England and the Treasury on economic stats. We're really privileged and proud to be part of the Treasury campus in Darlington. We've got an increasing growth team in Manchester that does digital and di digital kind of work. Uh, we do an awful lot of digital work. And then we've got the regional hubs, which is basically our ONS local capability. And as well as the point of this is, again, from a kind of purely recruitment perspective, it means that there's lots of places across England and Wales you can 
join the ONS and work from. We are increasingly across the country. But what kind of thing do we do? This is the breakdown of uh, the, the professions that sit within the ONS. Uh, we are a huge amount of people who work on digital data and technology. Recruit computer scientists, data scientists, eng computer, software engineers, as well as the people that you would expect, like statisticians, social um, researchers, economists, even, even geographers we have. So again, it's an organization where if you are analytically minded, um, there are, there are ex interesting, developmental, progressive, fascinating roles that take place within, within the ONS. And we, you know, and we are, I think, even now recruiting, aren't we, the sandwich place from students, GS scheme? Closing date next week. Closing date next week, so gs.gov.uk, have a look at that. But there's lots and lots of, lots of roles that come up. We're big recruiters of graduates. We're big recruiters through the traditional um, recruitment schemes. We also do an awful lot of um, increasing recruitment on, again, data science, and we do that on behalf of government. So if you're interested in careers in data science, then look at the website for the ONS Data Science Campus, because it, it does that not just for the ONS, but right across the system. So what do we do? We talked about that in the introduction, but we are, you will probably see some ONS data. If you put the news on tonight, you will see some ONS data. Right? Probably the Bank of England decision, there'll be a, a, a chart that'll go up on inflation, we produce the inflation figures. We produce what's called the national accounts, which is GDP. Um, we do labour market data, so unemployment, employment and activity. Um, and we do population migration help. Loads and loads of data that you will see all, all the time on the media that directly feed into the way decision makers at every level in this country make decisions. That's what we're producing. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a big operation and it's a high quality operation because again, people are making decisions based on this data that affect people's lives and, well, and, and livelihoods. So we are absolutely driven by the need to be high quality, but also we want to make sure that we're relevant, we're measuring the right things and we're timely, that the data is coming out at the right time to our people to do the right kind of things. So, and the way we do that traditionally has been through surveys. I talked about the field force. We also send surveys to businesses. Um, and we have to, to fill things in and we collate them, collect them, stratify them, aggregate them, weight them, bring them out. We also have increasingly over the last decade used what's called administrative data, which essentially is a kind of byproduct of kind of government or administrative processes. So if you... Um, if you go to, if you sign on for universal credit, you know, that, will, that will leave a administrative data point, but then we can use that to inform our labor market data. You will get a lot, a lot of this, there's been a lot of that. But increasingly, there are, the nature of the modern economy is generating new alternative forms of data, right? So, you mentioned I was an economic historian. When I started work in 1997, um, I joined the Department for Trade and Industry, which is now the Business Department, DBT. Um, we were technologically advanced as a department because we had email, right? We had email. If, for other departments, if you wanted to send information to the departments, you would send a fax. Do you know what faxes are? Yes. yes. Very good. You'd send a fax, and you would dread on a Friday afternoon hearing the clear and the wink the clink of the fax machine coming through and sending stuff through. Everything was analog, but we had email, right? We were, we were sophisticated, but no one else did. Apart, apart from the Department for Transport, DFT had one computer that had an email account. So if you want to send a document to DFT, you could email them, but they would typically say, someone else is using the computer, can you fax it through, right? So the entire system, and that wasn't just government, right? was analog. If you think now, everything we do leaves a digital footprint. Everything. This, this presentation will have a 
you know, will be streamed, videoed. So if you're able to capture that, then you don't necessarily need as much survey or admin data because you can start capturing the digital footprint of the economy. The other thing that's different these days and gives opportunities is um, the techniques. Right? The kind of analytical techniques that you would have had as if you, if you were here 25, 30 years ago to analyze data, you may have had a spreadsheet, but if you're doing anything more sophisticated, you probably have to hand code that yourself. Right? It would be a laborious kind of bespoke process. Whereas now, anyone who's, who's been coding here? One person, come on, come on. Yeah, right. You can just pull the techniques down from libraries, right? It can be done, done, in, done in quickly, seconds. And the other element is compute. Computing power is enormous. You've got the cloud. When we did some work on big data in, with the ONS back in 2001, um, if you wanted to do the analysis, you would basically code up the, the regression, essentially, the statistical te technique, and then you'd set the computer running for a week. And you would come back in a week and see what the answer was. Right? Those kind of analyses are done in seconds now. Right? So the fact that you've got this combination of techniques that are easily available, data that is just thrown off by the economy, and enormous computing power just changes what you can do and how you do it. And that just doesn't apply to things like the ONS. That is happening right across our economy as we speak. So I think this, this is a really important thing to kind of understand the kind of changing context that we're operating in. So here's some examples. I'm going to go through some examples of the kind of alternative forms of data that we're playing with. This is financial transactions data. Right? Every time you tap your card or tap your Apple Pay, you leave a digital signature. If you can harvest that, which we can, then you can start seeing what's going on in the economy in real time. Right? This is like fantastically useful in COVID. Right? Because you can start seeing the, behave, the behavioural response of consumers as the COVID happened. But it's also thinking about the... So, um, total monthly direct debit failure rate. Why is that interesting? But if you're concerned about a cost of living crisis, then understanding, do people have enough money in their account to meet the direct debits is quite an important piece of information. And so you can see that beginning to bounce up. We've got um, differentials between people. Right. So again, thinking about COVID, you know, the way the way lockdowns affect people shielded, people didn't shield, looking at the different expenditure profiles of, of different kind of sections of society. Um, we also use this kind of information during the, um, the, the funeral of the Queen, because obviously there, was, there were a number of um, bank holidays that were put in place there. That affected our measurement of GDP. So when we got the figures on GDP out, the, the normal system, we were able to check against the spending data to see did it reconcile. So it enables us to make better decisions, better decisions on our own statistics. But again, if you're in the Treasury or the Bank of England, if you're in the OBR, if you're planning a business, having this kind of information, really, really, really valuable. There's another one. This, is, this actually uses more it's clever techniques on admin data. But you know, if you're interested in kind of regional development, then understanding the R&D performance of your region is really important. Uh, traditionally, for government R&D, we'd know the place based where the grant went. Now we're able to actually trace that money through and see what actually the money was spent. And that's, again, if you're thinking about levelling up, creating new opportunities in different parts of the country, understanding where the, where the money goes, where it, you know, and we can do this, I know we've presented the, kind of the high-level data here, but we can do it at quite granular levels. So again, if you're thinking about you know, the, the R&D importance of this university to the local economy, this is the kind of information that we can now put on the table and we can link to other forms of data to provide much more evidence and impact. This is really exciting stuff. Um, we can do hyper looking at hyper-local data. So this is... Effectively, looking, this is basically working out how big is Nottingham really? Right? 
So if you think about a city is a function of you know, how many people can get in in a reasonable time, um, then you've got to understand how that works. This is, this is work that was originally done by uh, a guy called Tom Forth, who's based in Leeds, uh, does some really interesting stuff on this. And we, we've kind of, let's say, been influenced by, by him. But this is, not, this is Nottingham, and looking at you know, how long it takes to get from a particular place to the university. Right? Really interesting stuff, uses mobility data, um, the kind of Google tracking, that kind of stuff. Very interesting stuff. But obviously what we know from, from Tom's work is cities change size. When, when the, you know, there's congestion, the city gets smaller. When during the part of the day it gets bigger. So if you're thinking about your transport interventions, if you're thinking about where you want to expand your tram, understanding this is really important. And again, it's something that prior to the development of smartphones with GPS, you just couldn't have done. And now it is essentially very easily available. And it's worth saying, a lot of this stuff I'm presenting, this, this particular part of it, it all comes from work that the ONS's data science campus has been doing. And the point of data science campus is to ex explore these kind of forms of alternative data to see what you can do with them, how they can use public policy or industry, and how they can help improve our statistics. So for local policymakers, this kind of, this kind of material is really valuable. And we can do this. We put the shape files on there. We open source them. Anyone, anyone can basically play with their own geography and work out how, how effectively big is, is their area. Again, for the kind of regional development specialists, you know, this has big implications for things like travel to work areas, because this is actually the travel to work area. It's not what the census necessarily tells you to do, to pick up the point in the introduction around how these data sets change what we might think about the census. <clears throat> and this is, this is another one, um, my time economy. This, again, picks up the, our interest in um, how the economy changes. What, you know, we typically have a view about an economy operating nine to five, but actually, it doesn't. There's lots of different People behave, work in different ways. They work overnight. Uh, where do they work and what do they work? This is a particular piece of analysis we've done for Wales. We do a lot of stuff on Wales because of Newport. Um, and this is, this is some work we've been doing looking at kind of Merthyr and the, what's been happening to the nighttime economy. Where are people working? How many people are working? What are they up to? And they think about then from a kind of public, again, public policy, what does that imply for things like childcare provision? If you've got an increasingly growing nighttime economy, how does that, how does that all work if the public provision is geared around a kind of nine to five economy? So again, this is about us using new techniques to make sure we're measuring the economy as it is rather than the economy as we thought it might have been. And this is perhaps the final point in this one. The, other, the really big, exciting, even more exciting piece of... Um, kind of data that's now available is satellite. Sat satellite imagery is, is, there, you know, is there and it is abundant and it is easily accessible. You do not need to have your own satellite for satellite imagery. You can just buy it off the shelf. This is some work that we've been looking at to try and think about using the thermal imaging properties of satellite data to think about how that affects people. At, because we know when things get hot, people, there's more admissions in hospitals. So can you think about how you can predict that? So if you have... If you have um, data from the Met Office about you know, a, a heat wave, can you then think about, okay, where's that gonna be? What does that mean for vulnerable groups? Can you then predict what's gonna happen? Can you warn the local hospitals to expect an increase? You know, really, really interesting stuff, but satellite is just a very, very exciting area because there's lots of it. The resolution is really good and there are loads of kind of off-the-shelf tools that allow you to play with it and to analyze it. So I think that, that brings me to the end of just talking about the new data sources. Just, I want to finish off with uh, a discussion just a bit about AI and large language models. I think, just again, at the risk, who's played with ChatGPT? Very good. Who, who's used it for their work? They can't trace it. You should be should be more hands on that. I've used it. I've used it uh, for a um, parliamentary select committee briefing because it is, it's really good. And it's about a year old. Um, so what we've been doing some work to try and think about how, it, how, how is it being up to, how is it being taken up in the economy. 
Um, and this is some work we published this week ahead of the, the AI summit. And this just looks kind of by sector, really. Who, who's taking it up? And there's loads more information here. We, have, we run two surveys. One survey asks people about their use, and the other survey asks businesses about their use. Uh, it's on the website. It's really interesting, really interesting piece of work. I mean, obviously, what it tells you is, like, the IT sectors, lots of use. As you'd expect, like, chat is extraordinarily good at coding. So you would expect people to be using it for that. Uh, education. Right? A lot of use in education, as we saw. Um, and lots of you know, different sectors using it in different ways. I suspect the art, and once people actually realize what DALI can do, I suspect that one's going to move quite quickly. Um, so I, this, this is what's happening. So this is something that didn't exist a year ago. And now, what is it? 20% of IT companies are using, are using it, right? It's, it's permeating, right? There's, a, I think, a William Gibson quote about the future's already here. It's just not evenly distributed. This is, tells you, right? It's not evenly distributed, but people are already using it, right? Which is important, I think, in terms of thinking about your you know, career, skills, aspirations. These tools are there, they're being used, and they're powerful. The other thing I think is just perhaps slightly misleading on this one. Maybe not misleading. This survey asks businesses, are people using it? And I suspect the person who gets the survey in the business probably says they're not, because I'm sure lots of people in the business actually are, because they want, it is essentially a personal technology, the way it's currently structured. So this is, this, is what's this is the economy as it is now, right? This is happening. These tools are being used in anger. So how are we using them? Um, we, I just want to talk about perhaps two, two use cases, how we're using them. The first is um, to improve search, right? Search. Anyone use the ONS website? What do you think of it? Search is horrible. Search is horrible. Thank you very much. No, I mean, that is good customer feedback. In my previous life, uh, as a chief economist at Bayes, I would often use the Federal Reserve rather than the ONS website because it was, you could find the information you wanted. And this is an example, right, on here. We've asked for the average house price in Wales, right? And again, it's a Welsh example, Newport. So, and of course, we have on the website the average house price in Wales. We know what that is. You ask the website, we give you only two, end, two results, and we know there's more than that. And you have house price stats for small areas. Wales is not a small area, right? So it's given the wrong result there, and it's given it per square meter, which is interesting, but that's not the answer, right? And anyone who has used the website will find, and I think we're, you know, we're honest about that, we know it needs to be a better, better result. We've built a thing called Stats Chat. And this is the kind of, this is it, experimental. What's the average house price in Wales? The average house price in Wales is £217,000. That was a, you know, that was a video of an actual run of it. So we fed the entire ONS website into uh, a large language model. Um, none of the sensitive data, just the publicly available data. And it's now able to give us much better search results. Which, you know, if you're a user, that's great, isn't it? Immediately you get the result you want, rather than spend half, half the day trying to find, find it on the site, or trying to up, you know, add up all the square foot and get an answer. So that's how we, you know, immediate use case, we think that's really, uh, really powerful. The other issue we've been doing is, and this is my final slide, is we're using it to kind of encourage people to do to code, to be more better analysts. Now, I'm 50, right? I don't code well, right? But two years ago, during this, one of the COVID summers, I thought, I know what I'll do, is I'll, I'll try and get my skills up. And um, one of the things I want to play with is a database called LEO, Longitudinal Educational Outcomes Database. LEO is really interesting. It's, just, it's something you should all explore. Leo matches you, all of you, with your education record and your employment record and your tax record, right? It's a linked data set, which means if you look at Leo, you can work out. If you've done a degree at Nottingham Trent, 
in business, what on average you earn after two, five, ten years. It can also tell you, break down by male, female. It can do more than that, but we've only published parts of it. It's really interesting, really powerful stuff. Um, I thought it'd be quite useful just to do a little dashboard you can play with. See, I did, and I, 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 I did it. And it took me about a day to do this. Um, going onto Google, working out you know, which particular packages to use. This summer, I thought, well, tell you what, I'll ask, I'll ask ChatGPT to do it. And I fed it the Leo database, and it spat out the code, and it took it 11 minutes. So something that took me a day, and now I'm not skilled, 11 minutes to produce a fully working dashboard that, into, that looked at this enormous database. And not only was it able to do the coding, it, it kind of, I'm not going to say new, but it was able to read the data and work out what it was, what it was about. You know, it's saying, do you want the median or do you want the mean? You know, we would advise the median because it's labor market, that kind of stuff. So it's there, it make, it's a really powerful assistant. And just to finish, I mean, what, I'll put the screenshot. It's not, as I say, I'm not a very good coder, but this is what it did in 11 minutes. I'll put the screenshot of, I asked it, what's the return for a Nottingham Trent business graduate? And what it does show is that you're all incredibly shrewd people. Because a Nottingham Trent business graduate, after I think two years after graduation, comfortably out earning the national average. So it is clearly, you know, you are shrewd investors, but you'll make an even bigger return if you can get hold of these tools and really start using them because they're very, very powerful and very effective. And it's already out there. So I'm going to stop there, but I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you very much uh, for uh, that uh, fantastic lecture. Uh, before I thank you officially, just want to point out to uh, our uh, nice audience today that uh, don't forget about the podcast uh, series that we have. And uh, the next uh, one has uh, just been released. And that's a great read. And there are a very good collection on multiple subjects, particularly on leadership, please. Do go on the website and uh, listen as you please. So thank you very much, Mike. Uh, I'm just going to sum up some of the points you mentioned before I uh, uh, try and finish. First thing, you've all been invited to apply to work for ONS, I think. Uh, so. Uh, that's a very good invitation. I think that you should uh, have a good consideration for that. Uh, second point is you should make sure that you participate in the surveys they ask you, because the better information you put there, the more reliable the data that we then use to make decisions upon. Uh, because those decisions, and uh, Mike kindly showed, and becoming much more widely available, enormous amount of computer power, new sources of data, People are making serious decisions on these. People in positions of responsibility make very, very important decisions that affect your lives, affect our lives. Now, the counter to that was the question about the chat GPT, because that tells you that the data is not always reliable when you survey them. Uh, best estimates, best estimates. And um, that uh, is interesting. But uh, the most important message, I think, there was the last slide, and I'm thankful you've shown that, because you have all proved to be shrewd investors, as uh, Mike mentioned, uh, because our uh, graduates uh, do much better than your competitors out in the uh, labor market after, uh, after you graduate from our school and uh, Nottingham Trent University. So well done for your shrewd investment, and that's uh, very clever. So that brings me to give you a small token of our appreciation for making time in this difficult weather as well to come up and uh, share your thoughts with our uh, uh, graduates. Thank you very, very, Thank much. You very much. Please. Thank you.